Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to episode 119 of the Ask Weldon Show. Just a reminder that what follows is essentially my answers to a number of call-in questions on my app, the Anchor app. Okay, not my app. It's the Anchor app. So my station is right there. You can see it. It's anchor.fm slash Weldon Green, and you can go there. And essentially what you do when you want to call in is you go to your home and you go to a station, let's say like like this one right here, and you can just click call in to the station right there, and then submit your question, and I can reply to it in the app and also capture the audio for this show. So that is how you ask questions for the show now. Share your voice, share your concerns, share your questions, and uh, please enjoy. Hey Weldon, I'm the new ULOL coach and analyst for my university, and I just had a quick question about um, what you think Given that we have significantly less time to work with being university students um, as pro players to um, practice and uh, go over uh, VOD reviews and whatnot, um, I was wondering what you think is the most important things to uh, focus on in terms of uh, practice and in terms of analysis and going over uh, games and whatnot, uh, given the limited time frame we have. Uh, to give you perspective, that's generally speaking uh, 10 to 15 hours a week. Um, anyway, thank you. All right, so the question is, what should you focus on given that you have 10 to 15 hours a week if you are a University League of Legends coach? So first of all, the big problem with University League of Legends teams is that there's a, there's a wide skill set or a wide skill range on each team. Usually you'll have you know platinum members and diamond members and challenger members and the big struggle is that uh not all training time is created equal in terms of like what you can actually accomplish with one squad versus another squad at different universities but if we're talking about it like 10 hours a week so we're talking maybe two hours five days okay uh, as a unit i would work mostly on decisiveness and core compositions so I would work on, on decisiveness about like w- what exactly uh, your team's plays are. So form a really small, really tight-knit playbook of things that you guys know that you want to do. And then work a lot on compositions. And these compositions can be, they don't have to be meta compositions, okay? They just have to be uh, compositions where you can fit in a couple champions from each champion, each person's champion pool. So have the champion pools, you know, always out and always being adapted and, and have some sort of public forum where you can have everybody keep their top three champions up to date so that you have a vision as a coach of what the team's champion pools are and then draft like really good compositions out of that and practice skirmishing and team fighting and skirmishing and team fighting and skirmishing and team fighting with those compositions over and over and over again. And practice your like three, four, five set plays. You want to have a couple plays from behind, a couple plays from neutral, a couple plays from ahead that you can that you can pull off. And and that's what I think you should practice mostly. Uh, I think I think decisiveness wins a lot of games. I think there's some sort of Sun Tzu saying that is uh it's it's the momentum of concentrated in a single point of the bird's talon or beak or whichever it is that actually penetrates the flesh of the uh you know when the peregrine falcon dives. That is like a horrible misquote, but the essential idea is that when you take all of your force and you concentrate on a single moment, you have the see hero, kill hero effect of Moscow 5 from the days of yore. And that's really what's going to win a lot of games at, at that kind of level. So, yeah. Then the rest of it is just people should be training their laning phase with the champions that they uh, that they need so that they can play from behind in the lanes. Because that's like the thing that you don't want to do most of all is to is to int it when your team needs to to uh, not get snowballed against. Glad to hear you coaching and good luck. All right, let's hear this question. What do you think was the biggest difference in success between TSM and the failure of G2 at Rift Rivals? Okay. All right, what was the biggest difference between TSM and the failure of G2 at Rift Rivals? Uh, biggest difference, in my personal opinion, is that uh, <laughs> TSM was a better team. I mean, like... Well, <laughs> Are you asking in what ways were they better? Okay, so rewind to Worlds 2016. The EU teams were more or less similar to the NA teams. Um, The NA teams had more of the early game down and were 
much stronger in general with understanding how to uh, snowball the game and how to press advantages. The, the EU teams were much better in terms of understanding uh, first principles of the game. So, like, what do you do when and where and why? And fast forward that to essentially uh, MSI. And what you have is that the NA teams have gotten better at defensive play and first principles, and the EU teams have gotten a little bit better at uh, snowballing and at uh, ID, IDing, essentially, the plays that should be made in the early game. But UO, UOL is still going through transition here. Remember, they were like they were playing like monkeys all the way into uh, IEM Katowice, and then they started totally changing their style and getting really serious about the game, not just in scrims, but also on stage. Uh, H2K kind of went through a little bit of a downfall here. Um, Fnatic was kind of like picking things up. So fast forward to Rift Rivals, and here you have uh, essentially players in EU, teams in EU uh, picking really strong champions for, for weeks and weeks in the LCS and not really learning much about snowballing the game like systematically uh, through essentially through through map pressure into vision w into camps or buffs or obje or or neutral objectives but rather simply kind of like through uh, I would I would say directly down a lane like through a turret it's turret or nothing essentially and yeah I don't know I mean I think I think the same thing, the same exact thing is true between 2016 and, and right now. I think that I still see better first principles from EU teams. I still see that as the game goes longer and longer, North American teams are making more and more mistakes and EU teams are making less and less mistakes. And I think that that is, uh, I guess, promising. But you have to understand how much Immortals and TSM of 2016 and CLG pushed North America forward as a region in terms of systematic control of the jungle as a snowball mechanism. So the idea of taking your lane pressure and your 2v2 mid and snowballing that into camp here, camp there, camp here, camp there, and then into pressure on a tower, which gave you chip damage, which then gave you the tower, and then playing immediately for the next tower and buff. So like setting up a structured play immediately around the next tower and pulling it off in a timing window. These are the things that that you had to be able to do to play against Immortals and TSM and CLG last year. C9 couldn't do it at first. I don't know if you remember if you watched 2016, but you would see C9 really struggled with that until they got on board and started figuring it out. So just take that style of play and add, you know, three more months of practice to it. And that's not at all what's happening in the EU because we have Fnatic, which is like running around just picking whatever they want um, and not really essentially playing... I would say League of Legends in a way that's fruitful for the region. Um, sure, it's fruitful for their own standing and their own like optimism, but it's not really fruitful for the region. We have H2K, which has fallen off and kind of is like not, I don't know if it's just like internal issues or what, but they're just not on board with, uh, you know, playing super hard. Uh, or tr maybe they are on board with training super hard and playing super hard, but they just can't figure it out. And then we have uh, UOL, which is definitely on board, and they're definitely training super hard, and they're trying to play well, and that's coming along, I think. Uh, and then you have Splice, which fell off strongly, I guess. I um, am not seeing a lot of the Splice scrims, so I don't really know. But yeah, I would I would say that probably the training environment in NA is, is a little bit more systematic, I would say. They're probably hungrier because they super failed, you know, recently. 2016 worlds and an MSI, so I would be super hungry and dedicated if I was in that, if I was in that place. And uh, yeah, I think that Rift Rivals meant a lot more to them than it did to EU. But I hesitate to say that because I think everybody, when it gets down to it, actually wants it. You know what I mean? And uh, those are my thoughts. So I hope that was helpful. Alrighty. Hey, well done. I am a support main in League of Legends, 
And I've noticed there's a lot of controversy about whether or not you should have a duo queue partner, uh, talking about stunning your growth in League of Legends. And I find that I generally perform better when I can communicate with my laner. Uh, I duo queue with an 80 carry. And I find it to not only be more fun, but I find I get more out of it. Uh, perhaps I'm, I'm wrong. Do you think that I would do better learning to play with others where I can't communicate? Thank you for the question, Daryl. So let me, let me reframe it. Um, you're worried that playing with one single person is handicapping you from learning communication styles that are necessary with various other AD carries or learning other styles. The answer is both yes and no. So first of all, yes, of course, you can't learn how to adapt and play with other styles if you take the style win thing off the table. You're only going to learn how to play the style of your AD carry and the communication necessary with him. That's not a bad thing, though, because then that allows you to automate a lot of the processes around like dealing with how to stylistically mesh with your AD carry and communicate with them. And instead, you get to focus on uh, the 2v2, you know, or how exactly this uh, this lane should be played out or where your jungler is or how you can invade with him or where you should when you should go ward mid or, oh, look, there's a level two roam timer because we have a really strong snowball lane mid and he got the push. And if I zone this guy off three minions, like our Zed will hit six first and that'll be it. Done. Game over. So you have all this opportunity to spend the time that you would be spending on uh, synergy with strangers on other stuff in the game. So take advantage of that. Now, at what point should you worry about like trying to learn the the st- the the way the skills necessary to adapt to other styles and to read your AD carry and all that stuff? Um, I mean, obviously at the pro level, you, you don't have to do that at all because you're always going to play with the same person. Uh, so <laughs> I don't really know the answer to that, but I would say that as long as you have a consistent duo queue partner, I would worry more about the fundamentals of the game and the lane than the interaction and reading your your kind of lane partner. Because I feel like if you decided to get really intentional about that, then you could learn it and you could learn it relatively in a relatively fun way and, and, and relatively swiftly and painlessly. And at the same time, if you're already good at League of Legends, then it's even more enjoyable to do it. So that's my two cents about that question. Thanks for asking. Hi, I'm a uh, Hearthstone Diamond player. I've played since season one. I'm still playing. Um, I have over two thousand games, well, nearly. And um, hmm, I'm stagnating, and I'm trying to find ways how could I improve on the game. But I really don't know. Um, I try to watch some replays and stuff, but uh, I'm really like uh, inconsistent. Maybe you know a re- uh, solution what I could do. Uh, yeah, first time uh, using this up. All the good man. <laughs> Tough question here. Essentially, you've played uh, a lot of games, and you've been playing for five years, and. You uh, are stuck in Diamond, and you previously had hit Masters. So the jump from... I want you to visualize a a bell curve, right? Because one of the issues you need to visualize is that uh, like Masters, certain amount of LP, and Masters, uh, like 50 LP higher, is is quite a bit different. Uh, Because when you get to the top of the bell curve, the skill level between each point is much larger than the skill level between gold four and gold three or gold one and gold five even um so you're going to be looking for gains that are that are more minimal and less fantastical and to do so i think that you need to get consistent about a certain skill set so i need a lot more context actually to answer this question we would have to really start digging into your play style and stuff like that but i mean you you need to shake things up if you were if you need to improve your learning somehow so that you can actually get unstuck, you need to break the mold, which means if you play a lot of different champions, you need to get on one. And you just need to like master everything about laning with that champion um, and start studying the game so that you can autopilot the lane against anybody and do 50-50. And then you can start just like 
playing the the composition and the the map. And then if you uh, the opposite, if you just play one champion, you should just like start playing tons of different champions and tons of different roles and trying to like figure out stuff that you don't already know. Um, just don't do the same thing and hope that you learn. And by doing the same thing, I mean doing the same thing you've been doing for the last five years. Uh, and then the second thing I would do is I was I would get into a very very consistent vod watching routine. I mean like like literally uh, every single game that you watch, you are required that you play. You are required to watch it, no matter what. Okay, so every single game that you play from now on, you're required to skim through it. You have to watch the laning phase, some skirmishes and team fights looking at your decision-making, and then uh, your macro movements, like where you decided to go and whether or not you were right, and start predicting the jungler's location a ton during the game. If you're using plays.tv, you can predict the jungler's movement like uh, in, in audio, and you can record it, and you can play your plays.tv alongside your replay, and you can like listen to what you say to yourself, or you can just like remember. You can say, like, okay, I think the jungler's here, I think the jungler's here, and then when you watch the replay, see how accurate you were. Study their pathing. Okay, so those are the things that I essentially want you to do is make it a mandatory VOD replay. I want you to start studying yourself intensely as a mirror. And then I want you to get a model. So then I want you to go look at people who are better than you and try to figure out why. Uh, Compare your VOD to their VOD and their decisions to your decisions and start looking at why with the same champion and with a 50-50 lane, they're kind of colluding into a victory. Uh, and look for those very minor things. They're going to be tough to spot, and I'd like you to find them. Good luck. Hey, man. Um, yeah, I've played since season one. I play top lane. Um, I play over uh, 2,000 games every season. And um, I'm a diamond player, uh, hovering around the uh, diamond four and diamond one and I'm like uh, trying to find solutions to uh, be more consistent and uh, be the best player I can be and um, I was wondering if you could uh, maybe give me some solutions or I don't know maybe tips pretty much and I'm uh, pretty much open to anything and uh, keep up the good work uh, yeah <laughs> So Daniel, uh, you want to be consistent, and I assume that you want to claim climb, and you're stuck at a certain EOL uh, with over two K games played. I'm assuming like this season or so. Uh, so consistent improvement comes from meshing a either either having an incredibly well tuned implicit learning system that is designed by your parenting and your teaching, your teachers or by having a really strongly mixed implicit and explicit learning system that is always giving you progress, okay? So likely if people are plateauing, they need to, first of all, shake up what they're doing. So you can't keep doing the same thing. If you're playing a lot of games, play fewer. If you're playing no games at all, play a lot more, you know, that kind of thing. Um, If you're playing in the morning, start, if you're playing late at night, you know, start going to sleep instead and playing in the morning or in the afternoon or just taking a break or exercising or something, okay? And then the second thing you need to do is you need to get really serious about uh, picking apart your game and seeing it with a critical eye. So seeing your decisions, all of your habits, you need to find a way of taking your habits and making them strange again. Taking the things that you just automatically do and like de-doing them. Or you need to get your brain to notice them and to say, what? And to, to do that, essentially, uh, you need to emphasize quality over quantity in terms of your decision making and you need to emphasize quality over quantity in terms of your criticism so you need to get a little bit harsher on your mistakes and your failures and so you need to identify them and then and then see them and feel them when they happen again because what's happening is you're making the same mistake but you're not feeling it or noticing it maybe you don't know it's a mistake or maybe you know it's a mistake but it's so embedded in your habits that you don't even care to kind of like expand upon it or think that you could do it better and instead you see it as just a part of how you play and you decide to work on other things that you think are more effective instead of perfecting you know a mistake so i would say again like i said with big bapa earlier uh vod review is a really excellent way of 
forcing yourself to look at your decision-making quality and sitting there. You have to sit through all of your bad decisions and you have to watch them. And it's a waste of time because if you screw up the game, it's a complete waste of time and you've got to sit through that. It's like a punishment. So you're not liable to screw it up again because you don't want to sit through a whole nother VOD of watching yourself like make the same mistake over and over. Um, so that's actually really helpful for learning. And then the second thing is you need to look at the things and the habits in your play that you start noticing, the, the trends that um, flow around your champion. And you need to start looking for alternative uh, things to do. Essentially, um, going and looking at you know high-level streams and maybe taking lessons, getting some a third party to look at you and, and give criticism and give learning, uh, like laddering up uh, skills that, that you need to work on. Those are my thoughts. And I'm really glad I got my audio working this late at night. I'm so excited that I got it fixed that I'm streaming. So, Hey guys, thanks again for tuning in. I hope today's episode was awesome. Please call in your questions for the show so that I can stream a new one every single day. If I get enough questions, then I will be able to. And uh, I appreciate your attention. Talk to you later.